The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Should corporations around the world pay a minimum tax? The Biden administration is leading an effort to make it happen tonight, why and whether that's possible. Then it's tax time for all of us. We'll get some insight on special considerations for filing during this COVID era. Also tonight, paid sick days. Why is it apparently so hard for Ontario to move forward on this during this pandemic when there is such a consensus to do it? We'll look at the economics. It's Wednesday, April 28th, and that's all ahead on The Agenda. After citing what she said was a 30-year race to the bottom, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has called for global corporate tax reform. With us for some perspective on such an initiative, we're joined in Montreal, Quebec by Alison Christians. She's a professor and chair of tax law at McGill University. And we have to start with this. We have to start with you showing us the mug you just took a drink of coffee from. <laughs> Come on now, that's fabulous. Yeah, well, I really do love tax law. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've got the right person for this interview, clearly. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's uh, great to meet you, and thanks for coming on the program tonight. I want to start by just uh, reading something from The Economist from April 9th, just a little bit earlier this year. And the quote is, according to the Tax Foundation, a think tank, average corporate tax rates around the world have plummeted from 40% in 1980 to 24% in the year 2020. Let's just start with some background here. Why did that happen? Yeah, that's a great question and a great place to start. Let's start with how did we uh, get here? So, you know, tax rates used to be a lot higher and uh, they have been sinking, they have been dropping, and the race to the bottom is something people have talked about for a long time. So, you know, why is that? Well, a little thing called globalization came along, right? And capital became mobile. And when it was possible to invest anywhere, pretty soon different governments around the world were trying to get that foreign investment into their borders. And they used every regulatory tool available to them, and the tax system is, you know, one very tempting regulatory tool to, to incentivize different behaviors. I guess we can assume that the corporations love paying lower tax rates. That's wonderful for them. But in terms of society as a whole, has it been a good thing? Yeah, I mean, that's the question for the ages and why it comes up in every political discussion, you know, ever in every election, practically, we have these discussions. So, you know, why don't corporations want to pay tax? Well, corporations don't want anything, right? Because they're not uh, thinking sentient beings, but they're an amalgamation of people and uh, assets and activities. So the people who run corporations have ideologies about what are their objectives and the objective has been maximizing shareholder wealth and that has led to you know the sort of natural or you know uh, received wisdom that the objective of the corporation should be to reduce taxes you know by any means necessary this is of course an ideology and it's not quite accurate because we also have on the other side this idea that corporations are part of the fabric of society they rely on the infrastructure that is paid for by taxation and taxation is not throwing money down the drain, it's an investment, an investment in future productivity and future gains. So we have this tug of war, we sort of always on both sides. Uh, we want corporations to make profits and therefore we don't want to burden them too much. On the other hand, we need to have tax revenues to pay for the things that make it possible for businesses to exist and thrive. And those two go in different directions already. And then when you add globalization to that mix, now I I think most of the time we're constantly going in both directions at the same time. We're trying to tax and we're also trying to give away tax incentives. We're trying to raise revenue and we're also trying to, you know, pave the road to, uh, you know, making corporate, making it, you know, safe for corporations to operate here. You see this in tax competition. Let's see if we can get a, a clearer picture of 
I guess, who led the charge for lower tax rates? And we hear a great deal today about the fangs, you know, Facebook mm -hmm. and Apple, and Netflix, Google, et cetera, that they're the ones, the tech giants, who actually led this race to the bottom. Is that accurate? Uh, well, no, governments led the race to the bottom. The rate of tax is not up to corporations, it's up to governments. Um, and of course, you know, we think that the fangs give us something new, you know, and, and they do. Like, it's true, they're really hard to tax for all different kinds of reasons. But, you know, everybody's kind of hard to tax for different kinds of reasons, and governments have to figure out where to spend their time and their energy. And so, you know, where does the impetus to lower taxes come? It comes from a policy decision. Decision. And then the policy decision is, well, how much will it take, how much effort, energy, and money will it take to enforce a complex system? And as the system gets more complex, we have to pour more into enforcing that. Uh, you know, those are all policy decisions. So it's not like there's the this mass of corporations out there that are just footloose and no one can control them. That's not the, necessarily the case. I think governments can control and sh have shown that they can control corporate behavior through lots of different means. But it's just a question of, do we want to expend the resources and the energy to control them? And tax is one of those controls. We see, you know, you see it in other areas like labor restrictions and antitrust competition restrictions. Those are all different ways to try to uh, figure out how much freedom or how much liberty should we give the corporation in the fabric of our society. These are policy choices. Well, here's one reason, and I'll go back to that original economist issue that I referenced at the top. Here's one reason why governments might want to get a little more interested in that, and that is the economist estimates well, Americans Internal Revenue Service, the IRS, misses out on nearly $65 billion in tax revenue every year because of profits booked in tax havens. Okay, now, now is your opportunity, Professor, to teach us. <laughs> yeah. What does that mean? How does that work? What are the implications of it? Yeah. Okay. So there's so much wrapped up in that. So we really have to be careful with this word. I actually don't like the word tax haven because it implies that there is some other place over there that's doing some bad thing. And if only we could stop those people from doing that bad thing, then we would all be living in paradise. And that's not the case. There is no such thing in my mind as a tax haven. There are tax favorable rules and regimes in almost every jurisdiction. And the question is, well, which kind? And so there's different kinds and we're, uh, we're worried about different kinds at, at we're worried about different kinds in different contexts. So we're worried about some kinds of tax regimes when we think what's happening is tax evasion like people hiding money in an offshore bank account. But, you know, that's not really what's going on, or at least most of the time not what's happening with giant multinationals. The kind we're now worried about is tax-favorable regimes that lure in capital, that lure in um, legal fictions, and then associate income to them. So I know this is really complicated and it's kind of in the weeds, but here's an idea. Um, Google, for example, you know, they, they're at, their base is advertising. This is how they make their money, right? So they have a brand and the brand is something that's legally recognized. It's a thing that we can put a name to, you know, IP, intellectual property. And since it's something legal, we can put it anywhere. And then whenever somebody has to pay for branding, uh, we have that money go to where we said that intellectual property is. So, of course, there's going to be lots of different places that will say, hey, we'll take the IP. You can put it here. You can put it in our jurisdiction. And then all the income will come to us and then we won't tax it. But if you put it over there, they're going to tax it. And so that's sort of the basic story of the fangs is that they're using a lot of IP intellectual property. A lot of it is hard to value value, what we call hard to value intangibles, they can be located anywhere and jurisdictions around the world have made it their business to make their places be the place where the fangs want to put those things. And we think of, you can think of Ireland as, uh, as the exemplary, for example, for Apple uh, back in the 80s, Ireland lured Apple in with a very low tax rate and it was very successful. Uh, over the years, people have been less uh, accepting of that. You know, at the time it was fine. Now, maybe we're not so sure that it is fine. Let's do a for instance here, because uh, we often hear, I think people on the more progressive end of the political spectrum say things like, 
we got to raise corporate taxes and we got to make corporations pay their fair share. So yeah. let's, let's play that out. If governments in Canada raise the corporate tax rate from, say, 15% to 30% overnight, just for the heck of it, what would be the implications of that? Yeah, well, so I actually think that we have to make a little sidebar here. It really, to me, is such a mistake to only talk about the tax rate. And I know it's exciting and interesting and easy to understand that a 15% tax rate sounds like a lot better than a 30% tax rate. But a 15% tax rate on a very high amount of money can be a more tax than a 30% tax rate on a smaller amount of money. So you really have to think about how does the rate interact with the tax base. And when I, when I say tax base, what I mean is like, well, what income are we going to tax with that tax rate? So if you say we're going to raise the rate overnight tonight from 15 to 30, and we're not going to change anything else, then uh, I think we could say it's likely that everybody who's now subject to that higher rate will start looking at ways to minimize the base even more than they do now. So it puts pressure on that, on the on the tax manager to try to figure out, well, this 30% rate is not what we had forecast, is not what we ex expected. Can we get away from it somehow? So you sort of see in the literature, the higher the tax rate goes, the more lucrative it is to get out, get out of it. And therefore, the more likely it is that tax lawyers and accountants will be called in to help figure out how to manage that higher rate. So that explains how you can actually have a higher rate and bring in less money or a lower rate and actually bring in more money. Is that right? That's the idea. Yeah. So this is the idea, but we have to be so careful, right? Because this, there is an idea that a higher rate will actually reduce tax, but we don't actually know what that higher rate is. So some studies have shown that that higher rate is in the 70 percentage points. Now, we have never seen a corporate tax anywhere near that. Uh, and we did have a corporate tax closer to 50%. Uh, that was sort of the uh, high end uh, in a time when we saw great global, pros uh, we saw great prosperity in some countries. Now, the thing is, it's never in an isolation chamber. It's not like, well, we had 50% rates and look at how much growth we had. Yes, we also had, you know, destruction in Europe and the rebuilding of it by U.S. firms in after World War II. And of course, they were able to benefit from circumstances at the time. So we're always thinking about those rates, not in isolation, but like, well, what are the opportunities here and where is the competition? So. I think that con that question is so complicated and I appreciate that it's, you know, it's sort of only a thing that tax lawyers can love to sit around and think about, you know, well, where, what are all the possible variables that could go into whether a one percentage point rate is going to raise or lower your overall revenue. It's a tough discussion. You will see people who say, well, look at the rates have changed over time, but the percentage of the tax that we collect from the corporate income tax hasn't actually changed that much. And that tells you something about, well, yes, but yes, but we have also changed the base. We're constantly changing the base, not just, you know, changing what kind of income we tax, but with exemptions, with credits, with deductions, incentives, you know, it's, you know, there's lots of different ways to do these things. Some of them are more salient, more obvious to the public, and some are just not at all obvious unless you know and you're an insider. All right, because as you've described it, many corporations around the world are looking for the most favorable place to quote unquote park their money where the tax situation is most favorable. We now have America's Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen, putting forward an idea for a minimum corporate tax which has opened the door to a minimum global corporate tax. Can you give us some sense about how that might work, which I presume is designed to, to kind of repatriate some of that money that these big corporations are hiding in tax favorable locations, is that right? Well, they're not hiding. So I just want to be really clear. Hiding is, an, is, is, is a pejorative word, right? Yeah. Well, and it's also just, they don't need to hide because we're giving them those incentives. Sorry? It's legal. 
Yeah, exactly. They're not, for the most part, I'm not saying you all, okay? There's definitely some funny business and I would never say that there's perfect compliance with all the laws. But like for the most part, multinationals don't have to evade because we have paved the way for them to reduce their taxes in legal ways. So, so what is this global minimum tax about? Well, okay, to contextualize a little bit, the rest of the world has been talking about a global minimum tax for a long time, and the U.S. has been part of those talks. But under the last administration, there was some uncertainty created around whether they actually wanted to participate in that. And let's just, you have to think about that in logical terms. Like, if most of the multinationals we're talking about, like the FANGs, if they're mostly U.S. headquartered, why would the U.S. want to have a global regime where other countries can tax? tax those companies? What, what is in it for the U.S. for other countries to tax them? And I think the logical answer of that is, well, nothing. Mm -hmm. And so most, uh, I think most people are not shocked at all that when the U.S. said, well, we're not too interested in any kind of plan at the global level that sort of shuffles around the income to make it possible for other countries to tax. But the global minimum tax is different. Okay, so this is a little bit complicated. I'll try not to get too in the weeds with this. But here's the basic idea. If the U.S. has a high tax rate, but other countries have a low tax rate, then just in the same way as we were talking about, capital is going to be feared to flee. It, we're going to worry that capital is going to go to those places where the tax rate is lower. But if the U.S. has a high rate and then says, oh, and by the way, if you go abroad and you get a lower rate somewhere else, uh, we're just going to treat you as having received that income here and we're going to top you up to our higher rate. So whether you stay in the U.S. or you go abroad, you're going to face our higher rate. And the thing is, that's a really hard thing to do unless you get other countries to help you do that. Right? You have to be able to figure out, well, what income did they get overseas? And you know, how much tax did they actually pay? And what is the base? So when the U.S. talks about a global minimum tax, it's not obvious to me that what they mean is a global minimum tax that will make it possible for other countries to tax U.S.-based multinationals. I don't think that we should be assuming that. I think what we should be assuming is the U.S. understands that if they are trying to raise revenue from the corporate tax, then being undermined by a race to the bottom in which they have participated for decades, if that continues and they're undermined by it, then raising their corporate tax rate isn't going to get them the revenues they want. So getting cooperation from others might help make that happen, but it doesn't mean that the rest of the world is going to tax that income. I can see why the United States would want the corporate, the uh, cooperation of others to make this happen. I can also, given your description of the way things work, understand why other countries, it would not be in their interest at all to help the United States to make this happen. So is this thing kind of dead on arrival? I don't think it's dead on arrival. So I'll tell you how we usually do things in international tax. This is how we do things. We generate some energy around some problem. Currently, it's that the fangs and so on are not being taxed enough. And that is a real problem. I'm not minimizing that at all. That's actually a big problem for us. So we generate some energy around that. Then we go to the international uh, arena, and usually it's the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, that coordinates a cooperative consensus building effort. We go to them and they start making suggestions. They start talking about, well, here's the solution and here's that solution. And immediately everyone in the tax community pounces on that, says, well, A, it's too complex, it's not workable. B, it's not fair. C, it's not going to work unless the U.S. is on board. D, if the U.S. is on board, then it probably doesn't work for anyone else. Everyone starts arguing. And then because they have announced that they're building a consensus, they will, in fact, deliver a consensus. The question is, what will be the content of the consensus? So my prediction is that there will be some sort of thing that people call a global minimum tax. And when you pull back 
the the title of that and you look at what's in that package you're going to see all kinds of things about what the income base is consolidation financial statements and you know income statements and accounting standards and you're going to see all of this stuff and every one of those things that sort of makes you go well what's in this i don't even understand what they're saying each one of those things is a point of contention which then will be hammered out over years and years and decades until the next round when we say, oh, we have this problem, we need to fix this problem. And Everything I think- Everything old is new again. Yeah, exactly. I think that's why we see Canada and a lot of other countries saying, okay, well, oh, that's all nice. That's good. We're going to do that. But in the meantime, we're going to talk about digital services taxes. We're going to think about domestic solutions. You know, we're going to be sort of crafting a plan B, if you will, for what happens if that global uh, consensus doesn't form in a way that work works for us. In which case, Allison, let's finish up on this. If it happens as you describe it, if the OECD countries, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, if those Western countries come together and they are able to strike some kind of grand bargain, the likes of which you've just described, what could that mean to Canada's bottom line? Well, I think, again, this depends on whether Canada is able to identify some portion of income floating around in the world that we can tax on the one hand, or on the other hand, if Canada is producing the kind of multinationals that are reaching, branching out into the world and that a global minimum tax enables us to tax them, uh, our own Canadian headquartered multinationals. So, you know, both of those are, you know, just a question mark. It's hard to know. And I think that we won't know until we sort of see how things shake out. And by then it's too late, right? Then we already have a policy and we're going to be responding to the policy in the context that it's operating. So, you know, I hate to tell you that I don't know, but that's the, that's the reality. I don't think anyone knows. And actually that's why it makes people nervous, right? agreeing to a consensus that you're not sure whether you benefit or might be hurt by uh, makes people sort of not sure they want to enter into that. Well, I think our viewers and listeners, after watching and listening to this interview, all need one of those mugs because I think we now <laughs> all heart tax law. That was a great presentation. Allison well, Christians from McGill University. Thank you so much for spending so much time with us on TVO tonight. Thank you so much. It has been a great pleasure. For many, doing their taxes often slides to the bottom of the to-do list until just about this week, because the deadline is this Friday. And given the economic catastrophe of the pandemic, the job this year could be tougher than usual. With us to help in the Witchwood Barnes neighborhood of the provincial capital, there's Jackie Porter, certified financial planner with Cart Wealth Management. Jackie, it's good to have you back on the program. How are you managing? I am doing pretty good, all things considered, Steve. That is, the, uh, that is the line people use, right? As well as possible under the circumstances, I get you. Well, we're very close to the personal income tax filing deadline, of course, April 30th. Um, tell us in your view what the most substantial change this year for personal income taxes is compared to other years. You know, I think we can all agree that 2020 was one of the most volatile years we've seen. And that is actually never been more true than it's been for uh, people who were getting cash flow because unfortunately cash flow came to a screeching halt for a lot of individuals in 2020 um, who are just kind of doing their thing. And um, I think that's probably the biggest issue because the pandemic affected so many types of business, especially certain industries where um, all of a sudden they lost income and really got into a scenario where they were losing income and had to rely on all the government programs that were being introduced. So I think for people, individuals who lost income from their employers, they started to rely on CERB. Um, business owners started to rely on the myriad. There were so many different government programs that they had to pivot to um, in order to keep you know, their financial life afloat. So I think, I think that's really something that business owners struggled with and still are struggling with. 
Because of the pandemic, of course, uh, governments uh, at all levels have given us extensions on doing things like uh, paying municipal taxes or renewing our driver's licenses. Any indication whether or not they're going to extend the deadline for filing our taxes? You know, governments are in the red as far as their balance sheets. So I don't think they have an appetite for extending the deadline and like they have, um, like they did last year when there was there was so much more, um, so many more unknowns. And I think they were more willing to give people a break because they had a little bit more money in their coffers. So um, that filing deadline for those of you who are still waiting is April 30th. And the only thing they've said, Steve, is that they are willing to, for people who took advantage of the programs, so all of the subsidy programs I've just talked about, and who uh, earned $75,000 or less, they'd be willing to give them an extension on pay, a tax. Hmm. So okay. um, they, can, they can check with their accountant and you know, see if they qualify based on their taxable income. Um, that they've shown whether or not they'd be able to, you know, get a an extension to pay. That's about. Well, let me follow up on do. that. Yeah, let me follow up on that because I think there are going to be a lot of people with some questions around that. For example, uh, the CERB, do you have to pay tax on that income, or the wage top up, do you have to pay tax on that income? What's the rule there? You know, yes, you do. The answer, the short, quick answer is yes, you expect to pay taxes because, um, you know, at the time when we were all getting these benefits, you know, we were just happy to be able to use them to pay our bills. And, you know, I think for a lot of people, and this is something to watch, is if you didn't make income initially when CERB hit, but then later on your business started to pick up, um, you might have been paying taxes on your business income or income you earn from your salary. But if you add what you got from CERB and what you made otherwise, um, there's gonna be additional taxes to pay along with the taxes that would be owing on these programs. So definitely do the math and find out where you, you stand when it comes to owing. Cause that's, that's just yet another stress that people had to deal with during the pandemic along with worrying about cash flow is worrying about whether or not they were gonna to have to pay some of these programs back this tax year or in a future tax year, right? All right, let me do another follow-up uh, business related this time. There are many people who over the past year and change have whatever their occupation was beforehand. And if they did it outside their home, that was one thing. Many of them are now working out of the house. Does that mean that they now have uh, potential tax write-offs from working at home that they didn't have before that they should be looking into now? Yes. So, so that, you know, there's finally some good news. Thank you for asking about that, Steve, because I feel like I keep giving bad news to people this year. You can claim actually under the home office write-off, you can claim up to $400 of deductions on your income taxes for this year. Uh, if you were working from home, I believe it adds up to $2 a day, but the max uh, deduction, especially for those of you who aren't organized around uh, keeping track of all of your expenses, with the home office deduction, um, you can write off up to $400 of expenses for your working from home expenses. Um, the government has a secondary program that uh, if you rented out space, um, like your office space, and you um, rented out your, your home office space just because of not being able to use it in, during the pandemic, there are additional expenses you can qualify for. You just have to have all of the receipts associated with it. So um, again, this is a great uh, opportunity to ask your accountant if you've been organized, keeping all of your tax receipts to make sure you can claim every penny that you're entitled to, because it's a bigger it's a bigger tax benefit if you're organized. Mm -hmm. Now, what if you run a sole proprietorship? Four hundred if you're not. Four hundred if you're not. Uh, if you mm -hmm. run a sole proprietorship, um, I gather they don't have to file until June. Are there any new business write-offs uh, as a result of the pandemic that these folks ought to be considering? Yeah. So June fifteenth. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. Is the tax deadline, and that hasn't been extended either, folks. So don't get too excited. I don't think they will. The government's looking for your money sooner than later. Um, you have an additional uh, tax program, a deduction that you can claim this year. So I'm happy to report you can write off uh, subscriptions. So business uh, subscriptions for news magazines or uh, newspapers you'd normally have uh, subscribed to. You do get an additional tax write off of $500 uh, that you can claim. So that um, if you, like me, had newspapers or magazines collecting dust in your office, you can now subscribe for an online 
news magazine or online subscription, and you're able to write off up to $500 of those expenses. So and these are all legitimate thing. tax write-offs? 100%. 100%. Okay. If you have a business, is it important that you pay yourself a salary? This is a huge thing I'm always talking to my self-employed clients about because yes, it's nice to not have to pay taxes, Steve, but then where do you lose out? What's the cost of not you know, taking a salary? The, the big one is if you don't take a salary, you, you can't apply for things like a mortgage or even opportunities to grow your business because you need to show the government that you're earning a, a reliable income from your business. Um, you also have a scenario where this year, if you didn't actually show any income from your business, how can the government reimburse you or, or give you uh, access to these, these assistance programs if they can't show that you had any loss in income? So if you didn't show an income from your business, you would lo have lost out in 2020, a year that would have been so crucial uh, to have access to government assistance programs and maybe the lifeblood of your business in 2020, you would have lost out on being able to claim or access any of the CERB programs, um, any of the wage subsidy programs, the Canada Business Emergency Business Account. These were vital programs that kept, have kept business alive during the pandemic. So definitely important to show um, some salaried income. Um, another reason that you might want to consider doing that is to, to actually set up things like RRSPs. RRSPs are based on your earned income from the previous previous years. So if you're trying to diversify your, your streams of income away from your business, you would not be able to invest in things like RRSPs as well. I should ask you the sort of the flip side of that question, which is what would be the, the logical explanation for why somebody who owned their own business would not want to pay themselves a salary? You know, because they're thinking, I don't want to pay taxes. I mean, that's a really big motivation. Sometimes businesses are taking um, dividend income from their business, which gives them the dividend tax credit. So, um, you know, sometimes the, the government, their accountant might advise from a tax planning perspective that that might be an advantageous thing to do or, or take no salary claim, or they might not be able to afford to, maybe they're not able to afford to take a salary from their business, which is also an issue, right? Because you kind of want to, um, in order to, to run financial statements and see how your business is doing is, is to take a salary from your business and, and increase that and to get a sense of the overall financial health of your business. Um, so, you know, from a tax planning perspective, you know, there's opportunities to reduce your taxes outside of, of just, um, you know, taking a dividend income. In fact, uh, a number of um, provinces like Ontario have taken away some of the benefits of claiming just dividend income um, and making taking a salary and taking dividend income almost equal. So there's not as many incentives, especially from 2021 on, to just take uh, income from dividends. Gotcha. Now, Jackie, I want to um, I want to circle back to an example you gave just a few moments ago where you talked about a business that might have been in grave difficulty at the beginning of the pandemic. But then for whatever reason, they pivoted, they figured it out. Uh, the business came roaring back. Cash flow was good. But maybe they had, you know, loans that they had to pay off or, you know, other obligations they had to deal with. And as a result, they're cash poor right now. And yet, you know, here comes the tax man with a bill. If you're in that predicament and the bank account is empty, but you owe, what do you do? You try to get ahead of that. <laughs> First of all, again, in conversation with your accountant. So what's the damage going to be? If I owe, um, how, much, how much time um, will I need to pay that you can potentially figure out just having a sense that, you know, the business isn't doing well now. Well, then get your accountant to reach out to CRA. They, they are looking at uh, each and every person's circumstances. And based on your financial hardship, um, you can get an extension to pay your tax bill. So get ahead of it, talk to your accountant, um, have them reach out to CRA to make payment arrangements. Um, they are willing to look at that based on your financial circumstances. Does much of that happen? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This year I, in particular, um, I think CRA is open, but they do want uh, some kind of a repayment plan in place. It's the, the worst thing you can do is just not deal with it and have them 
come after you uh, because they certainly can. And people don't realize that when they, they pay their taxes, the government has access to their bank accounts. So if you don't file your taxes and you owe, and they know that you owe, they simply can uh, send your bank a demand letter and start coming up with their own repayment plan and just take that money out of your account. So get ahead of it, <laughs> talk to uh, the, the government directly if you don't have an accountant or talk to your accountant work something out, um, you know, they can read, uh, do the math and look at your financial scenario just as well as you can and see if there's no money available to pay. And, you know, um, you know, the reality is, is, is just coming up with what's a reasonable scenario for you to be in, in order to pay it. Maybe it's six months, but paying something is better than paying nothing. So closing your eyes and hiding under the covers is not a good strategy. Is that what you're saying? Um, yeah, they'll come find you. <laughs> they know where you live. <laughs> they know where we are. Okay. Uh, in our last and minute they know and where your money here, is. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Uh, in our last minute and change here, let's do one last thing here. And that is, I'm sure there are people watching this right now or listening on podcasts who just find all of this a bit overwhelming. And maybe they don't have. I notice your advice on many occasions tonight has been in, a, in, you know, in accompaniment with your chartered accountant. Some people don't have accountants. Yeah. So in that case, what's the advice? In that case, there are actually a lot of tax clinics um, available from different community organizations. So Google tax clinics in your area because you can get volunteers to help you file your income taxes. And, you know, so if you're again in a scenario where you are a low income, your income is low or you're in financial hardship, there are organizations available out there who will help you to file your taxes. Uh, the other thing I was gonna say is, uh, for those of you who have fairly straightforward tax returns to file, there's U-File and E-File that the government allows you to download, the software that they allow you to download, and you can file yourself, and there's prompts to give you opportunities to reduce your income taxes. They'll tell you about some of the programs available and, and prompt you to apply for those credits online. And you, know, you can file your taxes that way as well. Great. Just, Jackie just take action. Take action is always the best plan. Jackie Porter, certified financial planner. Really good of you to spend some time with us on TVO tonight. Many thanks. A pleasure, Steve. See you soon. Thanks again. Now, up next, a conversation that we recorded earlier today before the government's announcement this afternoon. Calls for paid sick days have come from all corners for months now, from public health, from the science table, opposition parties, social media, labor, and the list goes on. What is so tricky about this? Well, with us now, Rosalie Wanch. She is a health policy economist at the C.D. Howe Institute, and she joins us now from Waterloo, Ontario. And Rosalie, it's good to have you on the program again. I thought we would just start by getting a comment on the record here from the Minister of Labor, whom we invited to join us tonight, but uh, apparently his uh, schedule wouldn't permit. Here's a statement, though, from Monty McNaughton's office, which says, I'm pleased that the federal government committed today to coming to the table to double the pay for Ontario workers to $1,000 a week. We look forward to partnering with them to fill this gap and continue improving their program to maximize support for Ontario workers and their families. Our government will not burden businesses during this challenging time. We want to ensure businesses survive this pandemic and that workers have jobs to come back to. We are ready to work together on solutions that put the people of Ontario first. Minister of Labour Monty McNaughton on the record with that. Okay, let's dive into this, Rosalie. Do you think this new increase in what people are eligible for is going to fix the problem of people going to work sick or more accurately, making sure they don't go to work sick? Well, I think that it's certainly a step in the right direction. Um, whether or not it will be sufficient to ensure that all of those that might be in a conflict of interest at the moment between staying home and obeying public health guidelines and protecting uh, the rest of the population and then their own livelihood. Anyone that's currently in that situation is really who this policy should be targeting. And so doubling the benefit certainly will help um, as really the, the majority of lower wage workers are don't have paid access to paid sick leave and they're also more likely to not have the savings to be able to you know sustain the loss of income for a couple of days now in essence what we're asking is whether or not it makes economic sense to pay people not to work if they're sick and therefore not go to 
their place of employment, factories, facilities, whatever, and get everybody else infected. Uh, in term, I mean, you're a health economist. Does that make economic sense to you? It certainly does. Um, you know, from the perspective of workers and individuals and from the perspective of businesses and sort of the government and society writ large, um, they're really the potential risk of someone going to a workplace and potentially infecting their colleagues and causing an outbreak could have quite high costs in, I mean, I'm a health economist and you don't really want to think about human life in terms of dollars. But if we, if we do that, then when we're preventing death, uh, paying for a few additional hours without output does generally make economic sense. And I would add, um, particularly in the current situation that we find ourselves in Ontario, where ICUs are reaching full capacity, and there is real risk that we will actually have to be making choices about who receives life support and who doesn't. It really is becoming a direct relation to if we don't control COVID, then we will have to make life and death choices. And so particularly in the dire situation we're in now, it certainly makes economic sense to encourage people to stay home if they might be a risk. Uh, and by any means necessary. And if we can do that for really the same as what they would be making if they had gone to work, but remove the risk, then I see that as harm reduction and it makes good economic sense. Well, here's one of the things that I think a lot of people don't understand. There are very few issues in our society where you basically have 80% of the people saying, this is what we should do. And I, I guess it is either a very brave or a very foolhardy government that does not implement policy where 80% of the people are on side with an idea. And yet, this provincial government has, in its wisdom, um, what's, what's the expression? I mean, they've really ragged the puck on this thing. They, it's, pretty, it's pretty obvious they do not want to bring in their own province-wide, provincially run, paid sick days plan. Do you know why? I would say that there's, um, I don't know why, first, first off, because it, it really, Given the situation, it would make sense. However, I think if we sort of dive into the context a little bit, then maybe we can see some of the reasons, or I guess at least provide context for the discussion. And by that, I mean, if we actually look at what paid sick leave policy is across the country, uh, there were only two provinces that actually had paid sick leave prior to the pandemic. That would be Quebec and PEI. After five years of employment, you could get one paid day. And so really, we were in a situation going into this pandemic where nowhere in Canada were there uh, mandated paid sick leave that would have been sufficient to cover the recommended period of isolation. And so no, that's true, really but we did have paid sick days. We did, have paid sick, we did have paid sick days in Ontario before Doug Ford took over. The previous Liberal government did bring in two. Now, you're quite right. That's, that's not enough to cover what epidemiologists recommend for this current pandemic, but it was something. They got rid of them. Ford government got rid of them. Certainly. And I guess what I would like to point out is that prior to this crisis, it's not that it wasn't, you know, paid sick leave was certainly a labor policy that was being aided uh, moving forward, but nowhere was there um, really realistic calls for two weeks of paid leave immediately on employment, upon employment. And so what I think might be some of the issue in the current situation is that we're uh, really confusing or merging the issues between what would be an emergency sick leave policy and what would be sort of a permanent, more long-term, non-crisis situation, sick leave labor policy. And I think that the debate between those two things is really contributing to a lack of progress when we most need it. No, I take your point on that, but I, 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 I hear two conflicting things. On the one hand, I see the labor minister's statement earlier, which says we're not going to saddle businesses with added expenditures in the middle of a pandemic as they're trying to make an economic comeback. And I think everybody gets that. I mean, it, you know, and there are businesses out there that are suffering badly and, and we don't want to burden them with additional um, uh, obligations. Uh, on the other hand, I also hear the Premier and the Minister of Finance uh, from time to time saying we will spare no expense 
to protect people from the ravages of this pandemic. Um, you know, why not bring in a sick day program temporarily, as you've just suggested, that would have the government backstop or maybe take over that obligation from businesses altogether during the course of this pandemic? Then both of those statements could be true, but they don't seem to want to do that either. Well, I think that's interesting because that really it does. I think that the Ontario government, by attempting to build on the federal policy, is trying to come up with a compromise where they're increasing the benefit while not, um, you know, putting that onus on business, be it administrative or financial. Um, and that there was, I suppose, a certain amount of uncertainty up until a week ago, what the federal government might do on its own in terms of supporting Canadians across the country with paid leave. And really, I think following the federal budget is where these conversations really picked up. Not they, They've been happening really for over a year now, but I think it really sort of became the hot button issue in the last few weeks. And part of it is that it's one of the few things that we talked about a full year ago that would be helpful for controlling community spread that we still haven't really implemented. Um, many of the other policies we, we have implemented. And so I think this is just a sign of where we are in terms of progress. But I think that any sort of political um, debate between levels of government is not helpful to the actual situation. And so the uh, quote that you read from the minister actually is a little bit comforting to me. It shows that we're no longer sort of pointing fingers as in the federal government is saying Ontario needs its own policy. Meanwhile, Ontario is saying that they want to add to the federal government policy. If they, if there is actually movement and the Ontario government is working with the federal government to expand that benefit, then that's at least a positive sign in the right direction. Well, I hear you on that. But on the other hand, let me give you a few examples that, that I need you to explain this to me. When it comes to funding childcare, basically the, the provinces say, feds, give us the money, but don't tell us what to do. When it comes to funding Medicare, feds, give us the money, but don't tell us what to do. When it comes to long-term care, give us the money, but don't tell us what to do. This is a policy that is exclusively in provincial jurisdiction, paid sick days from work. And yet the province is not only not setting up its own plan, it's not only not asking the federal government to help fund Ontario's plan, it's saying you feds run this plan in provincial jurisdiction and we'll give you money to help make it happen. I can't ever recall that happening before. I'm sure it has, but I don't recall it. Can you explain to me uh, how this makes sense? That one's a tough one. The only thing that I, um... I might say is that there, since there is an existent policy, that there could be some logic in expanding on that policy instead of implementing another one. Um, however, there are some flaws that the Ontario government has itself pointed out about the federal program, um, particularly that it doesn't provide income support actually at the same time that people are take are need to take time off work. And so I think that it's interesting that they're both open about the flaws from the federal program, but are not taking actions to implement their own that would be distinct from that. So I, I guess it's, it's hard for me to not being a political analyst to really get into the logic of why that might be happening. But I do, I guess sort of the two sides of the coin would be, you don't wanna create more complexity if, if it's not needed. Um, which, since there is an existent program, there is some logic to building on what is already there. However, given that there are flaws with that program and that it is provincial jurisdiction, it is still a big question mark. I think your answer absolutely perfectly and accurately reflects the conundrum that, uh, that I suspect many people are feeling right now. Um, so let's, okay, fair enough. There is this federal program that exists. Everybody acknowledges it's not perfect. Maybe it'll be a little better if the province of Ontario uh, adds a, a half a billion dollars to it or whatever it's going to end up costing. But let's just go back to first principles. In an ideal world, you're in the middle of a pandemic. You want to set up a paid sick days program. 
who is the best, which is the best level of government to administer such a program? Well, I would say I'm not, that really depends on a lot of context, but I mean, that's, that's always the answer with policy is it depends. But I think really given this way things are in Canada and the constitutional role of provinces um, in the area of labor policy and health policy, it, it would make sense um, that these programs would be administered at the provincial level. Um, and I think that there have been, over the past year, there have been some strange blurring of the lines in terms of uh, where jurisdiction on some of these issues lies. And as you mentioned, there have been the example of province, the province offering the federal government money to administer a labor program is pretty unique. And so I think it's, it's really hard to say what what the situation could ideally be but if it was me i would say that we should get employers involved because one of the way one of the things that running through payroll can do is it supports people when they actually would receive their regular income and so where you know they won't actually they'll have co continuity as well as income support however given the situation with businesses then it would be on government to really uh, consider what the administrative cost and the financial costs of that are to businesses and at least partially compensate them for the additional cost given that they're under strain as well. Um, and really all of the incentives are aligned. Businesses, individuals uh, want paid sick leave. It's a massive risk for businesses at the moment since we're in an infectious disease crisis. And so there really is broad support. And as long as businesses won't incur massive costs, I think that they would be happy to come to the table um, and take their part because they have a stake in this as well. So yeah, I would involve a... businesses, run it through the province and really focus on the continuity and minimizing the impact to either businesses or individuals. Exactly, and the, the we had a representative of the Ontario Chamber of Commerce on the program a couple of weeks ago who basically just said the same thing uh, that you did. He's in favor of the idea, uh, understands that business doesn't want to pay the whole thing, but is prepared to negotiate uh, with the provinces to figure it out. It, it just raises this, it, it, we keep coming back to this question, which is why is this such a tough nut to crack? This seems like a no-brainer. It seems like a slam dunk. There are so many uh, aspects of society that are getting behind this idea, and yet um, it seems a very difficult one for the province to move forward on. Any theories as to why? I mean, I have my own personal ideas as to why, and as you mentioned before, uh, this government did, when it came in prior to the crisis, did reverse uh, legislation that would have implemented two paid sick days. And so there is a certain political aspect to this that I, I, again, don't necessarily have a good read on. But to me, as, as a citizen and as an analyst, I, I am also left wondering why. And with all of the support, I'm still left with a question mark, and sin which to me suggests that there's something that we aren't seeing from the numbers or hearing from the experts that's influencing this decision because from the numbers from what i'm hearing from public health experts and particularly the dire situation in ontario icus we really do need to do everything in our power to control the spread as quickly as possible we we really are in that emergency crisis situation and so I don't know what excuses either the federal or the provincial governments could have at this point to continue this as a political discussion. I think both levels of government need to sort of get rid of the politics because this is an emergency and particularly the provincial government should stop pointing the finger at the feds. And if the, the tactic of expanding the federal program doesn't look like it's going to be workable, they need to come up with an alternative as quickly as possible.
Okay, Rosalie, let's finish up on this because when the pandemic started, you and some of your colleagues got together, you had a bit of a round table, you came up with some policy prescriptions that could help guide the province through this storm. Want to lay just uh, one or two ideas on us here in our remaining moments? Certainly, and I think that's really sick leave was one of the things we discussed, particularly for healthcare workers and those in long-term care. Um, you know, we've all heard about the really sad situation in Ontario long-term care homes, but what a lot of people might not know is that 40% of the cases in long-term care homes were actually staff and that dependence in that industry on temporary or part-time work was in the early days, at least, a, likely a big contributor to spread across those facilities. And so we were really focused on the core healthcare system and different sectors at that time. But even then, there was discussions about paid sick leave for essential workers and, um, you know, looking to BC and income top ups that they did in the early days. And so really, these were recommendations that were being made by economists, policy wonks, academics, health experts as much as a year ago. And so at this point, why is the biggest question, but that's not the most important issue. The important issue is that we contain COVID, protect public health workers and the healthcare system from being overwhelmed, and paid sick leave is a part of that puzzle. But at the same time, it will not on its own be enough to control the situation that we're in. And so the current focus on it, I think needs to manage expectations, but we've known for a long time, this is a piece of it and it's still a missing piece of the puzzle. So I urge the government to really either work with the federal government or look at our their own policy options, but we need to find a way to support people in staying home when they should and following public health guidelines, because that is still priority number one. That's Rosalie Watch, health policy economist from the C.D. Howe Institute. Rosalie, it's good to see you again. Thanks for coming on to TVO tonight. Thanks very much for having me. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, April 28th, 2021. Tomorrow, we've got another installment of our TVO, Toronto Star Initiative, the Democracy Agenda. This time, Democracy and the Challenge of China. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by viewers like you. Thank you.